Day 6 of 11 Days of Remembrance Chapter 7, Across the Sea In 1943, Larry and the of 90 air gunners had graduated with boarded a train bound for New York City. It was a long train ride. In order to pass the time, most of the boys and draggled in a few card games and more than a few drinks. Exciting uh, uh, the exiting the bus that had bored them from the train station, Larry and his comrades stared it with Larry's eyes at Manhattan Pier eight. Un hundreds of commanders uh, 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 Dry eyes and had hundreds of governor or not, the boys were in awe of the Big Apple. Most of them headed from small towns or farms and had never even seen Toronto, let alone New York. Their eyes gazed upon the streets and wonder. There were hundreds of people walking down the sidewalks. Soldiers in uniforms, men in business suits, women carrying paper bags, of groceries and young boys holding piles of newspapers and crying out headlines. They were shops everywhere. A man wearing an apron was standing outside a doorframe holding a broom and yelling in Italian at a presumed delivery boy who was yelling back in English. Their voices seemed to combine into one, dribbling the of everyone else. On the sidewalk, as the formed a contra drum a noise, the city heartbeat, the men standing on the pier with turned their eyes upward to the massive skyscrapers that seemed impossibly tall and majestic again the clear blue sky. Nothing a king was beginning to form in the back of his neck. Larry lowered his eyes and turned his head to look at the harbor. He had the distant feeling that he must be standing on some sort of alien planet. New York was so incredibly different from Churro, Nova Scotia, that uh, it finally began to hit him how far away from home he really was and how much further he had yet to go. Gazing out the water, Larry's eyes rested on the keel of a capsized vessel. The SS Normandy was a French ocean liner built in Saint Nazaire, France, for the French Line Company, Gentle Transatlantic. When launched in 1932, she was the fastest ship in the world and still maintains the distribution today of being the most powerful steam turbo electric propelled passenger ship ever built. As a passenger ship, she was not a commercial success and realized party on um, government society liberty to operate. When the Nazis invaded France and the country began to overcrowd it by the Vinci French, the Americans seized her and renamed the ship USS Lafayette. On February 9, 942, sparks from a welder's torch lit a stack of thousands of life vests filled with a uh, highly flammable material that had been stored in the first class dining room. To Compound the problem, the beautiful woodwork in the dining room had not been removed and the fire spread rapidly. The ship had a very efficient fire protection system, but it had been disconnected during the co conversation from SS Normandy to USS Lafayette. The U New York City Fire Department's houses did not fit the ship's French lines, and all the passengers aboard the vessel fled. The enormous amount of water pumped aboard the 
burning vessel caused it to capsize nearly crushing a nearby fireboat that was fighting the flames. Looking at what was left, the once magnificent ship, Larry felt closer to the war than he had ever had. Docked directly behind the wreckage of the Normandy was the gigantic Queen Elizabeth. She was the second of two superliners Canard had built for the New York service that provided regular transport to United Kingdom. Launched on September 27, 1938, she had never made her maiden voyage. Instead, she was painted gray and was designed to become a troop transport during the war. She had carried 750,000 troops overseas and traveled 5,000 nautical miles. Adding to those numbers, Larry had comrades made ready to board. Considering the chaos, the pier seemed to be in the men were processed quickly and efficiently. One board of the ship, they were each assigned a berth. Space was in short supplies, and every inch of the boat was being utilized to accommodate the 1,600 American troops, 90 air gunners, and one RCA pilot. The berth that Slaves the the more than the hammock setting and Larry and his uh, overturn of air guards began the long trip across the Atlantic Ocean. The engines of the ship had barely started turning before the first poker game was dealt. Larry had been playing poker for most of his life. As a kid back on the farm, he used to play for match match sticks instead of cash, but the end of high school, Larry had perfected his skill at the snooker table and was a rare occurrence that he did not walk away a winner. Larry took to all forms of poker, like duck to water, and all through had no formal mathematical training other than grade school. He had an on current ability to determine probability, Larry was generous and outgoing, and because of his travels, he had come to know and deal with many more people than others in his age group. He learned to read people. Larry could detect a change in an opponent's behavior or demeanor that gave him clues as to what the player was actually holding. He was consistently handing, reading, and attempting to narrow the possibilities down to a rate of hands that made sense. Based on the past actions of the opponent throughout his life and into retirement, he could then and won his share of contract bridge and crib tournament. Without ever knowing what was going on, he became a card counter. On the third night aboard the Queen Elizabeth, Larry was knee-deep in Rasha's game of blackjack. There was plenty below deck. Air was thick and bony. Well, Larry carefully put down half and putting them in safety. Larry was counting out on top. Late on the night, a lone RCA pilot on board the ship, bolted and decided he had enough. Shaking his hands, Ed Larry introduced himself and complimented the man on how he had played the game. Not as well as you, he laughed, putting Larry into the shoulder. My name is George Burling. Larry did a double take. You don't mean George Buzz? Burling him, you the man smiled, the one and name name same. Buzz was just returning to the front after a bone and purposely dry. He had hit every minute of it and was looking forward to getting back to the action. Buzz was born in Bruin, Quebec. He 
first took control of an aircraft 933 and by 1938 he had fully licensed his first intermission as a pilot was to go to China and join the Flying Tigers. Unfortunately he had tired to cross the border in the States illegally and was imprisoned instead. When his, he was released the world had entered into war. Rosemary tried to enlist into the RCAF as a pilot. His application was rejected, however, due to a lack of academic requirements. He had tried to join the Finnish Air Force, who was engaged with the Soviets, but was then warned about he could get his parents' permission. Instead, Berling sailed across the Atlantic in a convoy landing in Glasgow, Scotland, and to less than the RAF. He had forgotten his birth certificate, however, and he had to return to Canada to get it. But after surviving the return trip, the RAF accepted him as a pilot. George and Good uh, Education, top fighter pilot, the man seemed to think eventually he had little use for bullshit and bureaucracy and content uh, that disciplinary claims he had commander Hugh Garfrey DFC threatened him with a court martial for stunning in a nothing in a tiger moth aircraft and hundred feet over the airfield the powers that be however decided to promote him to flight lieutenant instead <clears throat> Burling returned to Canada in April 1944 where he was given an honorary discharge in October, despite attempting to join the USAAF. As his wartime flying was over, George ended his career with 31 sorties and one had confirmed kills, nine complaint damage along as a DSO to a service order, a discern flying cross, and just how far that this I fired three times in 1948, he was introduced by it to fly fifty ones for the Israel Air Force en route while landing at Fury Air Force in Rome, Italy. Berlin vastly crushed his Northern transport aircraft at 26 years of age. There was suspicion that the time of the accident of possible sabotage, though nothing was ever proven. After six days, the Queen Elizabeth made landfall at Green Crook, Scotland. Larry was up 500 American dollars, and he used the money to buy cigarettes to trade once he got on shore. It was a beautiful day, and Larry stood on the deck of the Queen Elizabeth, lost in thought, thinking at the mouth of Riverside was the first one of his family to land. The family he had screened from the Sutherlands and the McDonald's were both part of the 170 people that sought refuge on a ship named Hector in July 1773 in search for a better life. They immigrated to Hector, Nova Scotia and later settled 65 kilometers south in Turo. Learning over the rail and breathing in the refreshing salt water air, Murray felt nothing but extra. The land before him was lush and green, and seemed as far away from war as he own home town. Coming up beside him, Mike McKinnon lit a cigarette. He was looking uh, well while he, Mikey, was found. Enter in such a place. Larry grants his friend. Mike thought for a moment back another drag of his cigarette. He goes for the golden old days of, you know, of Larry. One of us would be the impression of a great Claymore shore, and one came down lurking the way. By that it was many Mickey. I am some glad you aren't spoiling a kit this day. God knows the 
wind is strong enough that we will probably be to a show of parts. No one wants to see. Mike punched Larry jokingly on the shoulder as both men erupted into laughter. Hearing the boat engine finally silenced and soon the grain plate lowered, both men grabbed their kit bags and prepared to go ashore. Waiting on the pier was a Scottish bagpiper intent on playing while the soldiers disembarked. He barely got the chance to pick up his bagpipes though as Mike had grabbed his own throat and noise and began to imitate the sound of Scottish bagpipers playing an amazing grace. Larry was worried that such a gesture would insult the piper who had come to showcase his talent, but instead his jaw dropped and his hands rose together in applause. Soon the entire crowd was applauding Mike and his ability to imitate the bagpipes. Three weeks after the arrival, Larry and the rest of the commanding got for two weeks of leave in London, England. Being young lads so far from home, London was an experience none of them were prepared for. They had seen New York briefly before boarding the Queen Elizabeth, but to have two weeks themselves in such a grand city as London, well, all other friends you. The first thing Larry noticed as a stepped off the bus was enormous amount of rubble lying in the streets. Great piles of rock stood where built buildings once had. They seemed to be distant where it was only a little over two years since London had been bombed, consistently for 76 nights by Nazi Germany, in which generally to record was, was lost during the horrible time, but evidence of the bombing was still apparent. The new Canadian gunner scouts sort of stood in silence. They looked upon the destruction as a visions because of them feeling a first reaction as they were finally witnessed the work of the ceremony. The second emotion and Larry began to feel deep in the pit of his stomach was guilt. The planes he, he would be flying in would drop bombs that would cause equal amounts of people cash crop. Yes, they would be dropping them on Nazi Germany, but there was no guarantee that the bombs would not be dropped and killing innocent people, homes, churches, towns, halls, and buses, which will all be destroyed by those bombs. And although he would not be one to release them, Larry could help but feel the playing a part in the destruction of civilian lives. Checking into the YMCA near Hyde Park in central London, the gunners could not make up their minds what to do first. With so much to see and do, the boys decided on Madame Thurst Wax Museum as their first stop. These were the maid were Baker Street. The first thing the maid has has been just damaged by Roy Strickland, went up on a security guard and began questioning him. The security guard did not respond and continued to stare straight ahead as the man continued to ignore him. Roy lost his short temper and began to yell. When the guard still wouldn't acknowledge his presence, Roy raised his fist and aimed it at the man's face. That's when, when they realized the guard was made of wax and they had all been fooled. Roy never lived that one down. Across the street at the YMCA, the main entrance of the hair park, every evening girls in the British Army would raise their bones and hair park and hope of Warding off possible V1 rocket attacks. The idea behind these giant air balloons was to make it very difficult, if not impossible, for low flying aircraft to make an approach close enough 
through the target. Sometimes it worked and most times it didn't. A few days after their arrival, the dance of the, 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 of the street runway machine was hit by a V-1 rocket. Other people lost their lives. There was two pubs near Hyde Park that the gunners frequently one was called the crown and the other the team shooting shutting down for a bite to eat one night at the liar or Larry asked his waitress how much the salmon sandwich were she looked at his Canadian uniform before she replied they're free it was obvious to Larry that the people of London had been thorough through hell and were very appreciative of the help of the Canadian soldiers. They were out of their way to make sure the Canadians felt welcome and while Larry was grateful for the gesture, he made sure he always paid for his food he ate and his wine. The people of London had been through enough without just hang out precision food for free to strangers. Most of the other guys in his country felt the same way. Some of them even ran out of money and had to make a visit to the Canadian Casolan to get more. They took themselves on a pub crawl one evening. Larry, Dennis, Evans, and Orsherkin went along the streets of London in search of a bar that promised a good night. They found one that seemed to have a lot of action going on and decided to enter. At one end of the bar and boys began to notice a bit of pattern taking place. Patterns of the pub would routinely uh, approach the same well event waitress behind them counter. They would speak to her for a minute and then turn to walk the door the side of the bar. Seeing this happen several times, Larry decided to approach the barmaid. Excuse me, miss, could you tell me what's behind that door? It's a private member only club, she replied. I see, said Larry, pulling three bobby pens from his pocket. Well, these get me a membership, he asked. She looked down at Larry's extended hand and leaned in so that only he could hear. No, but six of them will. Reaching into his pocket once more, Larry pr produced three more bobby pins. Motioning for the other guys to join him, Larry followed the barmaid to the door. Now, you Canadian lads, mind yourselves and don't get me in trouble, she said. She pressed the button under the bar, and no sooner than she released it, a large man opened the door and rushed the three gunners inside. Part of the bar was nothing like the other side. The ball of fire was nothing short of a spectacular evening. The way the food boosts and her room payment inside the sterling silver did, and the Three Canadian gunners made it to have themselves a great time. As the evening drew to a close, three friends were soon passed where Dennis replied that he did not. Larry turned to ask Roy the same question. Roy, however, was nowhere to be seen. Looking down to Dennis, Larry asked, where the hell did Strickland go? Before Dennis could reply, they heard a moan coming from the hedge the, from the street. Strickland has had through the leaves. Larry expected to see Roy over a stone wall, as stone wall is the same to be laid at every hedge in London. Instead, he was greeted with a eternal on sight behind the as the ground seemed to drop off Larry Street instead of down to set a train track below. The moan he had learned out was coming from Roy, who was attempting to climb back up the slope he had obviously fallen down. He looked 
dazed and confused and fell over quickly as tried to make it back up to the road. Laughing, Larry yelled down to him, What the hell are you doing, Strickland? We don't have to catch the bloody train until tomorrow. All he got was another moan. At the end of their two-week leave, the gunners boarded a train bound to the smallest county in England. It was in ruin, the Crowfield 14 Auto Training Unit, LTO, up traveling through the English countryside. A loud roar, detecting retarded click, click, click of the train. Looking out the window, the gunner spotted their first enemy aircraft. It was a German Fokker's Wolf F F W one ninety, and it was one of the were on a bombing mission upon arrival at the. There was the mission had been a success for the Germans with many losses into the FWs destroyed a hotel. The officers in charge wasted no time and 24 hours after their arrival, the gunners had headed had to the groups. Two engine bombers, the old Wellington was one hell of a bird in its own right of Marvel of flight engineering using a geoastic construction method. The first edge of the Wellington was built from number of aluminum alloy channel beams that were formed into a large framework, wooden batterings which grew into the aluminum, and those were covered with simple Irish linen. The fabric that made up the exterior of the aircraft was covered and numerous scopes of plastic liquor until the skin was strong enough to withstand flight. The interior of the aircraft had been stripped bare for the guns to use their training on survey not every night was piled. A gunner instructor for Sergeant air gunners with the fuse was empty. The easier move from floor to floor. The training flights were long. Airgas pilots tried to get their gunners accustomed to the aggressive maneuvers that they had to perform in a dogfight, where the gunners sat behind them. Men spared. One gunner was rear turn trying to hit. The targets as Strickland yelled a voice over the sound of the wind rushing past the aircraft. All the while the pilot stream avoid enemy fire by making 90 degrees one way, pulling up, cracking the wings over the other side. He tried the nose of the aircraft down so violently that their bodies were processed into their seats. Weighted a thousand pounds, by the time the plane touched back down on the grass runway on board, were happy to be back on the solid ground, except a pilot who looked like he just had the most fun of his life. The crew to such extreme stressful training missions were laughing and laughter, got all full permission of the night he spoke to Wallace McIntosh. McIntosh had already completed one tour of duty and he was involved with training new crews. Before the end of the war, Wallace would team up with Larry as a tail gunner. That night, however, Wallace was recruiting a particular training mission that shot out to him for good reason. On board a Wellington there was a full crew the Leary Gunners had President McIntosh Robo over turbulence. The four men lost his balance and fell off the catwalk. Luckily, two of the men 
locally over the pilot pushed the nose of the plane down into a dive, something escaping an enemy fighter. The poor gunner who had already pale went the what went the sea through his the fire field his legs were going to fall off as the pilot pulled the plane level. Another aircraft radioed him information on you appear to have a profession beneath your aircraft, the pilot responded as the kind of profession do, do you think I have, Lieutenant? Well, sir, where I'm sitting, it appears to be a pair of legs. Grabbing the intercom, the pilot began to think apparition for Microsoft. It was responsibility to to bring the aircraft back in one piece and all of his crew along with it. He was fierce that his aircraft had been damaged. With the situation explained, the pilot turned the plane around and headed for home. Here's a, the landing the you be enough the clearance for a man's legs to remain uninjured. He, his last comment to McIntosh was, I will give you Heads up on short final. You can tell Bozo to start running, then he should be all right. Every gunner was looking to team up with the best crew to go to war with. The pilots, navigators, wireless operators, bombardiers, and gunners knew there was an accomplishment between the crew members, even one below average crew member could mean the difference between life and death. Those of version that the next day an Aussie named Bill Smith asked Larry to join his crew. They were slotted to fly in a Wellington for gunnery practice with six other gunners to make Christian dogs. The pilot was also an Aussie John Crouch. Bill was sitting near the seat as the student pilot. As they taxied the runway, Bill turned the twin engine aircraft into the wind and applied full power for takeoff. Sitting in the tail, Larry found the takeoff roll to be a bit bumpy, and as the plane lifted the ground, it caught a crosswind that launched Larry into the right side of the rear turn as a plane began to climb. Larry heard the thumb of the landing gear behind retract. Sitting in for the turning mission outside the, the tail gun, the starboard engine had blown and was producing absolutely no power as the port engine was unable to produce enough power to keep the airborne. The plane began to descend. They did not have enough altitude to turn back to the airfield, thinking that he was going to crash and burn before he ever fired the enemy. Larry watched the thumb over bank, uh, over both aircraft days, and Larry looked into the time port side engine burst into flames. Thankfully, all the crew members managed to escape with their lives before the fire of the port engine engulfed the entire aircraft and set it ablaze. In shock, Larry crawled on his hands and knees until they reached a large tree on the edge of the field, resting his back against it. He tried to gather his wits and make sense of what had just happened. Panting his left life jacket pocket to make sure he his lucky rabbit foot was still in its place. He reached it in his right pocket and grabbed his pack of cigarettes. By the time he was taking the last drag of his second smoke, the crash crew had arrived to extinguish the blaze that had once been an aircraft. When the fire was finally put out, the crew made their way to Larry and put him on a stretcher to transport him to 
MIR. Larry found himself wobble on wobbling legs in a well examining room. There was a light knock on his door before well endorsed young nurse entered and clocked the door softly behind her. Suddenly, all of Larry's aches and pains were forgotten. She simply pronounced uh, Larry and a lovely, soft voice and said, Here, love, I'm going to help you out of your flight suit. As she leaned over to assist him, he could smell the slight scent of lavender in her beautiful absent hair. One leg at a time, she put off the flight suit and laid the tattered and torn garment over a chair next to the examination table. I'm going to give you a hand up to sit on the examination table, she said, and she did so. Larry could feel the slight pressure of her right breast on his forearm and thought this was almost worth the cross. From the sounds of it, you're lucky to be alive, Sergeant. Here's hoping that luck stripped to like glue. She winked at him with her pressure blue eyes and added that the doctor would be with you shortly. She turned her heel and exited the room, leaving Larry sitting on the examination table with his lower jaw resting on his knees. He had enjoyed the sight of her coming into the room, but the sight of leaving left him absolutely breathless. By the time the discerned-looking doctor arrived, Larry had already made up his mind to ask her out on a date. The doctor cleared his throat, and Larry was brought back to the present. Looking up at the doctor, Larry figured the man had been in his fifties. He had a full head of gray hair and immediately turned pencil lines. Mustache. How are you feeling, son? His British accent was strong, and Larry had had a hard time understanding him. I'm okay, except for one hell of a headache. Well, well, let's ha have a look at you. There is a possibility you might have sustained a slight concussion. The doctor held up his hand with his thumb holding inward and asked, How many fingers do you see? Four. Good. Now I want you to focus on my finger. Move. Right, left, down. Move your head over. He moved his finger to the right, to the left. A look of concern said, Hmm, I think you sustained some optical damage on your left eye during the crash. I'm going to need to run some tests for now. Larry didn't let him finish. There's nothing wrong with my left eye. He was tired, burst, and pleasured that the doctor was going to take his medical away from him. Waiting to make sure that the point was made, Larry raised his voice. I was born this way. I, I fought like hell to get into this bloody Air Force, and I don't want you giving any goddamn trouble over it. There was a look of shock in the doctor's face at first, for my sadness. The eyes could have been your ticket out of here, boy. I could have had you on the next train out, but if you want to risk your life in the circus they call a war, then I am sure as hell not going to stand in your way. He put his hand on Larry's shoulder and said, I'm going to give you some medicine for your headache. I recommend that you take a couple of days off from training. Well, a final squeeze on his shoulder, the doctor turned to leave the room, but not before saying, God bless you and keep your life, keep you safe. For the next 
couple of days, the trauma of the crash combined with the medication the doctor gave him, Larry felt feeling drowsy. He spent most of his time indoors. Finally, feeling like he was returning to his normal self, Larry ventured outside three days later, stationing outside his barracks, snooking on the sun that rarely sun in England. Larry was having a smoke in the middle of a daydream. He was caught off guard as he was approached by a young man he hadn't met. The man presented his hand and introduced himself as Ron Peters. After exchanging a few poser, Rob, Larry stopped and asked, Shoot, Larry replied, as a kid, I could pick sparrows off our barn at 70 yards. Well, then, you sound like a kind of guy we've been looking for planning eight missions on Boston's. We're moving up to Lancaster's, though, and for the that, we need a tail gunner. We have an excellent pilot, Douglas Smith. Harry Crusher will be our flight engineer. Dennis Gare, front Gunner, Bombardier, Lawrence, Big A, our navigator, and Alex Blake, the mid upper gunner, and I'm Royals operator. We need hoping that you agree to become our tail gunner. As far as crews went, the more the experience, the better. These guys had always flown eight missions, so Larry didn't hesitate when he uh, agreed to join them. They followed the Day, Larry was assigned to fly a routine training mission. A, a new crew over England were observing where boarded the Wellington. The, thinking of the recent crash, Larry couldn't help but feel the Wellingtons had outlived their day and should be retired. The problems caused by the old birds had cost more than one man his life during training, and he was exactly comfortable climbing aboard the undressed that going to war meant risking his life but he didn't relish the idea that he may lose it before he even got to the chance to fight and simply target being because the plane w was sitting in a w was more suitable to a museum display than active duty the takeoff was smooth one, and as entered the airspace over London, Larry was just beginning to feel ease again in the aircraft. Minutes later, the relaxed metal state was right out the window, and anti-aircraft batteries on the ground became firing at them. The pilot during the swift aircraft was left, and the sailing confused to to why the British were firing at them. Larry asked Larry McCarthy what was happening. The guys on the ground mistook us for Germans. He called it friendly fire. It happens sometimes. Sure as hell doesn't feel friendly from whom we're upsetting, Larry cried. In order to avoid any more friendly fire, Doug alternated the aircraft's course to take them over the south of England into its was long, however, before the course led them straight into an electric storm, flashes of flaming lights were the only break in the otherwise dark gray sky. Looking into the vast brush, Larry was caught up with him. Such a storm, Michael burst of wind could burn the aircraft down through the Wellington skin and the with a Oh, the wearing white glow. They were flying in St. Emil's fire, and Larry had learned about the phenomenon created from a glowing object flying through an electric charge. First, through the flying in a giant ball of fire, but that, that perfectly safe, nothing was burning. Larry could only describe the eerie fearing of the other. Others just thunderstorm to a safe landing place 
and an alternate strip. Larry had two days off before another training flight with Doug Smith and the rest of the crew. They had a green great flight, no drama at all until the landing. Doug was in the middle of making his final approach and was shocked to see that the ground crew, defense crew had dug a new gun implement on the left side of the runway. He had landed on his runway. Trusher Times knew the approach like the back of his hand and knew that exactly the no line of fire and a time to start he could have controlled the power levels he still land landed without anyone knowing that they had touched down that space that he was flying a machine made of fabric weighing thousands of pounds into a small grass strip the balls had to be in line and order for everyone to even serve as a landing, let alone grace the runway. But today, someone put an available he was experiencing today. He would distract just enough to send his approach to hell and all of Alaska too. Doug was from Fisher. Oh, do not do not forgive me. Again, Larry thought almost out. Oh. Again, he packed each nostril with cotton and uh, covered the bridge of Larry's nose with a piece of plaster. Well, you look like an ugly son of a bitch, and you look like you had a breathe through your mouth, but I think it's safe to say you're alive. As soon as Larry got back to the barracks, he took three of his pills the doctor had prescribed for him after his first press and so straight through for the next 12 hours as last through his dried off term was uh jesus if that training was hell it's going to be like over germany that's the end of chapter seven um you see a veteran say thank you um uh, say oh i am thankful for what they did so I can be free and so I can make these videos.